Hello everyone, this is Robert and this is the frame of Crippling Depression. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the frame and the structure and what I like about it and what I really don't like about it and the changes it's going through for its final competition. So let's take a closer look at the frame. So here is the frame and structure for the next iteration of Crippling Depression. It's gonna look very, very similar to the last one because at the last competition I actually had two sets of this frame machined. So the outside panels are identical with a couple little modifications. And then I'm using the same type of frame rails as before. I just made some new ones or had them water jet cut for this. Um, please be sure to check the chapters down below to kind of skip around. Um, there is also a link to a video that goes over the whole structure a little bit more in detail. I'm just gonna kind of skim it over a little bit here. So this whole thing is CNC machined out of 6061 aluminum. Um, I actually had this one outsourced. Um, I think the first two versions um, I made here in my shop, but it is bigger than the work envelope of my Tormach and I didn't have the Avid at the time. So I outsourced this one. Um, these are just water jet cut because they're largely 2D and I still need to do all the extra holes on it. And then the outside frame is all just CNC machined because there's a lot of pocketing and weird stuff on the middle. So I think that's pretty much all in terms of the structure. We basically have this weapon block up front that bolts into these rails and then the rails are actually fit in two little pockets on the front and the back and then you can kind of see how everything else goes together right now there's only two fasteners holding this whole thing together they're just sitting here in the back that just kind of gets everything lined up but everything else is a pretty tight press fit and there's dowel pins holding everything together when I'm in a competition, when I do the final assembly, obviously there's screws in all these things. But for right now, this is just kind of um, sitting here all pressed together. So um, let's first talk about what I like about it, and then we'll talk about what I don't like about it. What I like about this frame and chassis is that it's relatively sturdy, um, but that actually comes right into what I don't like about it this thing takes so much damage. And that's kind of the point of crippling depression. It's kind of meant to absorb a lot of damage and ultimately protect, protect all the goodies inside. If you watched my previous video about the drive pods, they sit like or one sits right there and the other one sits right there. The outer structure can actually take a significant amount of damage and still have the drive working. Um, for instance, here's one of the panels from last year. Um, you know, you can see that these things just get chewed up and crushed. And let's see, where's, here's a front panel from a couple of years ago. You can see these massive indents and what you might be able to see is it's um, pretty curved. Let's see, here's another one. I mean, just see how messed up these things get. And that's kind of crippling depression. It is meant to take just an absurd amount of abuse. And since the weapon is mostly isolated in the inside and the drive pods are just kind of completely separate, those systems still end up working, but the frame just gets trashed. And that's a bit of a problem because every single year I need to make a whole new frame. And it generally lasts a competition. I've never swapped one out during a competition but it's kind of a pain. Towards the end of the competition, nothing fits, nothing lines up. I'm using duct tape to kind of hold it together. And this bot does definitely rely on things being kind of flat, level, and perpendicular. And towards the end, it just doesn't really work like that. So the weapon isn't as effective. I usually have to run upside down. So that's the biggest thing I'd like to change about this frame is maybe take some of the excess aluminum from the outside and make a stronger internal frame and do sacrificial panels on the outside that can come off. Any one of these panels is really integral in the frame. If anyone kind of gets screwed up or bent, there's really no way for the whole thing to still fit together. So I need to figure out some other change for that. Another thing that I don't like about Crippling Depression is its top and bottom armor configuration. Um, it uses two millimeter thick carbon fiber. So this is just one of the pieces that sits like that. Another one sits there and on the underneath side. 
have a big one that kind of sits like that. And you know, these are fine and they do the job. I'm not really worried about hammer bots because um, <laughs> they're hammer bots. I'm um, not really worried about overheads that much because the weapon actually comes like this. You can kind of see an outline. It comes all the way here. So it really protects most of it. So if there's gonna be any kind of overhead attacks, I just flip it upside down, no big deal. But this stuff is relatively thin. It's only two millimeters and you can see it just gets absolutely demolished every single match, every single competition. So it's really hard to replace. It's just once again, another piece that you have to replace. I've never been able to carry these through on a second competition. The other issue is because this is an undercutter, this needs to sit pretty flush. And you can see there's a lot of rub marks. Well, actually the rub marks would be here. Um, but you can see all the rub marks that happen. Um, that is just because everything flexes. It's a somewhat flexible system because combat robots. And my biggest gripe is you have these two screws right here, and that is meant to hold it down. Every single competition towards the end, this is being taped down because if it comes up, it'll come in contact with the weapon and then just rip off. And I've had that happen before. So it's just kind of too thin and too flimsy um, to be really held in place properly. I have tried titanium and aluminum. Those were the first iterations. Titanium ended up just being way too heavy. Um, I wanted to spend the weight elsewhere, but I need to come up with a better way to do this. And all of this is pointing towards a complete redesign from scratch, ground up. Everything gets thrown in the dumpster and I just start over from scratch. But these are just kind of some of the things that I don't like and are not ideal about the overall design of crippling depression. So those are the things that I'm not really going to change or can't easily change. Let's talk about the two main improvements that I'm making for this competition to make this better. If you look at this wedge setup, it is a lot better than it was previously. Previously, I was only using one of these little attachment points. I don't ask, I don't know what I was thinking. I think this was maybe one of those afterthought things, but I was only using one wedge nub and the wedge would just come off instantly. And if we look in the back, you can see that the frame is set up. There's three holes here, one, two, three. Once again, I don't know what I was thinking. The center was for the screw to hold the nub and the other two will dowel pins for alignment um, just to kind of hold it laterally and everything. So each one of these was only being held in place by one 1032 fastener that was, you know, maybe only a quarter inch in. That's not enough. It wasn't even close to enough. And another side point, this whole frame uses all 1032 fasteners, which is I don't know, like a metric, like an M5 for people that only understand one system, haha. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like an M4, M5, something like that, which is a relatively small fastener. And when I was going through this, having worked on Copperhead for so long, I was like, man, these fasteners are tiny. So if I was gonna do a 30, I would do like a quarter 20 at the minimum for all the fasteners, just side note. But anyway, you have a single 1032 holding those nubs on, that wasn't quite good enough. So I've moved over to two attachment points and each one of these is a quarter 20. So I went from a single 1032 to four quarter 20s. So quadrupled the holding force, something like that. Um, I'm keeping the same wedge lit configuration because these actually worked out quite nice. They're UHMW with um, these titanium stabilizers on the outside. The titanium is there because I don't want these to just rip out. UHMW is still pretty squishy. So at these small weak points, I didn't want it to just pull right out. So the titanium is there to kind of hold that in place. And then I have um, little screw inserts into these little um, brass threaded inserts that go through. So you're not gonna pull those out and I haven't seen issues with those pulling out. And because of this configuration, I'm not doing the overhead bar, I'm just doing the discs. So I wanted to stick with my light wedge. Um, so I'm just using the light um, titanium wedge. I think this is like an eighth of an inch. It's not a great wedge, but this isn't really meant to be a wedge bot. Um, this is just kind of when I need it. Um, I'm gonna try and use the weapon more than anything. So that is one change. Let's uh, flip around to the front for the other. So the other problem I was having with this structure is I hit a lot of things and this weapon block likes to kind of start to get really loose. 
I'm not sure if you can see it. Yeah, you can kind of see it. So there's two dowel pins. I talked about this in the weapon videos. Two dowel pins and two screws that hold the weapon block to each frame rail. And those dowel pins with all the strikes was just kind of getting hit back, hit back. And then this whole thing would start to loosen. And it's nearly impossible to get to those fasteners to fix it because you basically have to drop the engine. You basically have to take off all of these panels and get down to this bare piece, um, which means taking out the drive, taking off all of the external pieces. It's basically breaking it down as much as you can. So it's not really practical to do in the competition. So I have two new holes up front that actually go and screw into this weapon block. So I'm actually coupling the front plate directly to the weapon block. The whole idea is that you have a undercutter spinning like this and the hits tend to come in this direction. So it's pushing the whole thing back. So hopefully these two fasteners will help kind of keep it in place. And even if they start to loosen here, it'll help keep it lined up in this plane. So that is the thought. That was kind of the easiest solution. I couldn't really find a place for any more dowel pins. I'd have to make a lot of changes to do anything different. Fun fact, if you don't have a 3D printer, get a 3D printer. Here's why. I wanted these holes to line up with the most meat on the front. So if you look at this front plate, you can see that there's a lot of pockets. I don't wanna drill through the pocket. I wanna kinda of have it here or here or here. But then I also have the weapon block, which doesn't really have a lot of places to drill into either. So for the SOLIDWORKS model, it's pretty easy to see where those holes are, but translating that to the plate is a little bit trickier. Obviously, I can put this on my CNC machine and kind of indicate it, or you can just 3D print a little jig. Done. Just kind of goes right in those holes and lines it up. So all I did in SOLIDWORKS is I figured out where I wanted the hole to be, modeled up the hole, and then just made this little part around it. 20 minutes to 3D print. Holds in like that, drill through, and I know it's in the right location. And you just mirror it and make one for the other side. So this right here is a great example of 3D printing. I want a really precise hole location, eh, but I don't want to go through the trouble of indicating this piece, which I said is larger than the um, work envelope of my machine. So it gets kind of weird and complicated and I have to pick off all these weird features. Or you can just 3D print this little tiny thing that just sits into an existing feature and indicates your hole location. Nice and simple. It's interesting that Crippling Depression was the third robot I've ever made. Um, Cuddles first, then Kamikaze, just kind of like as a quick joke robot, and then this. So this is one of my first and earliest robots. So it's kind of interesting going back and learning what I did really wrong, what I would do a lot better. And if anyone's using this video as a reference for featherweights, I would say there's a lot of things to take away from this, but there's a lot of things to not take away. And the biggest things is use larger fasteners, go up from 1032, use at least quarter 20, something like that. And also try and get it as small as possible. The new meta is a lot smaller because quite frankly, this structure is just really heavy. And if I was gonna make this whole thing probably like half an inch smaller, you'd probably gain probably a couple pounds. I mean, it's that significant. Once you start taking a cross section of this bot and removing it, you gain a lot of weight. So currently right now, we're looking at about 10 and a half by 14 and a half by about three and a half. So if you're looking to build a featherweight, this is relatively big. This is a bigger featherweight. You're gonna to wanna to go a lot smaller than that. So just thoughts. Um, also, I think the weapon system is probably a little bit overkill. Um, these motors can draw eh, maybe, maybe, maybe about 100 amps a piece. It's pretty crazy. Um, this thing can have like a two, two and a half minute spin up or a two and a half second spin up time, which is pretty quick. I think the um, weapon could probably be scaled back a little bit and it also takes up a significant amount of room. I wouldn't change much about the drive though. The drive is overall pretty good, but it is fairly bulky. These things aren't that heavy, but they're pretty bulky. So little things I've learned um, and I would do things very differently. I don't think I'm going to be doing a featherweight again. I think if I'm going to build a next bot, it's probably going to be in the 12 pound class. I think that's kind of neat. Um, kind of not that into the Beatles anymore, but I think like a 12 pounder would be pretty fun. So I don't know, maybe be on the lookout for that. 
somewhere in the future. But hopefully you got something out of this, and this is probably going to be one of my last videos ever on crippling depression, so I'm kind of trying to go through anything that I want to say about it. Um, I think aluminum is a good good choice, um, but I would like to try and deflect some of that energy. I think trying to absorb every last little bit of it maybe isn't the right way to go. We will see. I don't think that crippling depression is going to do very well at this competition. I'm just kind of going to go out and say it. I think it's maybe a little bit old, a little bit outdated, and I don't really see it winning, but we will see how that goes. I'll let you know. Um, anyway, I'm rambling, so thanks for watching. Um, see you in the next video. Like, comment, subscribe, do whatever you got to do. Um, Facebook, Instagram, check out the links down below. See you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.